I would like to introduce our meeting facilitator and moderators, Sir Laurie and Joe. Laurie is a senior engineer and a senior environmental specialist in the resource protection division of OCSD. And Laurie is a board certified environmental scientist. Laurie has been with OCSD for over 28 years. Before she became a senior environmental specialist, Laurie worked at the OCSD lab for 25 years, where she analyzed fish and uh, sedimentation, uh, sediment for PCD and pesticides. Laurie is a graduate of Cal Poly Pomona. Thank you, Laurie. And uh, <laughs> Joe uh, Rickenberger is a professor of civil engineering and environmental science at Loyola Miramar, uh, Miramar University in Los Angeles. He is a professional engineer licensed in California and four other Western states and has T5 water treatment operator licenses. He has been a member of the Academy since 1976. I don't know who can do that. <laughs> he has been full time at uh, LMU for 27 years. Before joining the faculty, he had a 30 years of professional engineering experience with Parsons. Uh, with Parsons Engineering Science Inc. and uh, Jim Jim, yeah, Jim Jim, and the County of Los Angeles. He's a graduate of um, Marquette University and USC. Please help me give a, a welcome, warm welcome to Laurie and Joe. Hi, good evening. Thank you all for coming and for navigating the traffic to get here. I understand a few of you had a little issues, and I apologize for that. But on the other hand, where else can you have a dinner under the stars in the middle of October? So <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> um, I also want to thank Squirt for hosting our event tonight. Squirt is very near and dear to my heart, particularly because um, I don't know, I think I told you, that many, many moons ago, I began my environmental career right here at Swerve as an intern from Cal State Long Beach. And uh, it wasn't right here. Back then, uh, uh, Swerve was under the direction of Willard Bascom in a lovely location on PCH in Long Beach before it was renovated. And all of us interns used to joke about how we had to run to our cars so we wouldn't get mud. But I'm so thankful that I have moved in here so you can just leisurely make your way out to your vehicles when you're done with our house. <laughs> We're thankful for that. I would like to now introduce our first speaker who happens to be the executive director of our host facility, Dr. Steve Weisberg. Dr. Weisberg's research emphasis in developing tools to support implementation of and data interpretation from environmental monitoring programs. Beyond his research activities, Dr. Weisberg focuses on linking the needs of the management community with science. He serves on numerous advisory committees, including the State of California's Water Quality Monitoring Council, the California Ocean Protection Council Sciences Advisory Team, the California Sea Grant Program Advisory Council, and the EPA's Board of Scientific Counselors. Dr. Weisberg received his undergrad degree from the University of Michigan and his PhD from the University of Delaware. Dr. Weisberg will discuss how climate change will alter aquatic system management and relate impacts to decisions that water quality managers will be faced with. Please extend a warm welcome to Steve Weisberg. Hello. Thank you. I was actually asked to cover two topics. I was asked to give a kind of a five-minute introduction of what is Squirt. Uh, so I'll do that and then tell you a little bit more about climate change and kind of setting the stage of what some of those issues are. So as background, what is Squirt? We are what's known as a joint powers agency. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar, a joint powers agency is a public agency that is formed when multiple government agencies have a common mission and rather than each independently trying to accomplish that mission, they join forces, start a new organization that does that work for them collectively. In our case, that joint mission is to provide unbiased scientific foundation for water quality management. We're not a regulatory agency, we're not a policy agency, we're a science agency, but we judge our success on whether or not the science that we do is being used uh, in a way that affects management. 
hopefully when you see some of the things we're doing, you'll say, hopefully that does. What it makes us, I think, interesting and unique and uh, functional is that we have 14 member agencies that, um, that form Squirt, and they're an interesting mix. Four of the largest wastewater utilities in the state, probably four of the largest in the world, actually, because of a population density. Four are the county stormwater management agencies. Um, they're essentially the public works departments that oversee stormwater. And six are regulatory agencies. So what you have is 14 public agencies, but a combination of both regulators and regulated working together, forming a common bond around science. Uh, what makes the organization really effective is that the heads of those 14 agencies serve on our governing board, what's called the Squirt Commission. Um, and that provides us a unique interface uh, between science and management. Uh, it's a tremendous privilege, actually, that the heads of these agencies, and Robert Ferrante sitting over there is one of those 14. Actually, Jim Stahl used to be one of those 14. Um, uh, come and spend, essentially, a day here, once a quarter, to hear what's in new in science that should affect the way they manage. So it's more than just doing the science. It's a transmittal mechanism of science into management. And uh, I think it's one of the unique aspects of, of SQUIRT. Um, these are the research themes that we work on. It's a, an eclectic mix, all water quality related. Um, and so what I've been asked to do today is talk a little bit about what we're doing in the climate change area. Uh, I'm gonna start that by saying that when we look at cl climate change, we look at it from the perspective of there are four what we call drivers or pressures that develop <coughs> climate change. In essence, climate change is increased atmospheric CO2, and the most direct way that it affects water quality management is CO2 essentially infiltrates from the atmosphere into the ocean. More CO2 in the ocean is essentially ocean acidification. The more indirect ways are that it changes climate, and when it does, when it makes things warmer, then things like water temperature changes. Um, when you change climate, you change hydrography. And, of course, warming waters um, not only melt ice caps, but essentially expands the water, um, and so you get sea level rise. So those are the four, essentially, pressures. And when most scientists talk about working on climate change, um, you go to a place like Scripps, as a, for instance, what they're all working on are these pressures, understanding the relationship between activities and how that's going to change CO2 in the atmosphere, and then between those activities and how it's going to lead to changes, what's the change in water temperature, what's the sea level rise change. Where Squirt comes at it from are the next two, impacts and management actions. That's where most of our research is focused on, because when you get change in uh, water pH, it changes the calcifying ability, it changes the toxic bioavailability. So for instance, you have standards right now for metals in water, change the pH, the bioavailability of those metals will change. So in a sense, the impact changes because of that. Um, so again, water temperature is going to change the distribution of biology. Um, so when you're trying to assess the effect of, say, a wastewater outfall, you might have a lot of things that are going on in the background, changing conditions that aren't due to any kind of discharge, it's due to simply changes in water temperature. And also, uh, you all might have heard uh, algae and blooms like it hot. Um, we're going to see, and we are already seeing more harmful algal blooms as a result of things like climate change. <laughs> the last part is what can you do about it? And so, um, in the area of sea level rise, as a for instance, what do you do with wetlands? Do you let them essentially become inundated um, and become wetlands so now instead of emergent vegetation, submerged vegetation? Strategy number two, you move them backwards. Uh, strategy number three, you help them accrete, which by essentially putting more soil out there or changing the sediment management strategies. All of those are possibilities. What SQUIRP does is it works on how, um, how effective are each of those strategies. And in fact, we have a document on wetlands migration that essentially is a roadmap the state is using to figure out which wetlands do you want to do an accretion process, which wetlands are most amenable uh, uh, to essentially backwards migration. Um, so those are some of the kind of science things that we work on. But there's two that we work on more than others, and I think you're going to hear a lot about sea level rise from other speakers today, so I'm not going to cover it. I'm going to focus on two, because I think these are areas 
we're in a real leadership role, and I think that these are issues that don't get brought out as much as some of the others. One is acidification, and one is hydrography. For acidification, let me start off by saying that at a personal level, I think this is the defining issue for my generation. And the reason I say that is I take a look, there's a lot of people here from LA County said, the biggest essentially environmental issue, if you go back looking 50 years ago, was DDT on the Palos Verde shelf. Everybody worried about that. Okay? But if you think about it, it's a small blip on the radar because once you stop putting it in, the stuff starts getting buried, it starts getting dissipated, and in a sense, the problem goes away, and all the critters that might have been affected in the local area now repopulate from nearby areas, and things go back to normal, and they're actually in pretty good shape right now. With acidification, you let the water get too acidified, you're dealing with something that works on an entire West Coast-wide scale. So in a sense, if and when you go back and fix it later, which would be hard enough to do, but if you can, where's the repopulation going to come from? So in a sense, it becomes a tipping point. And so that's why it's a very tricky issue that you want to get ahead of. I will tell you that in Southern California, the ocean is already acidified. The way that we tend to look at uh, this is something we call a ragged saturation state. When a ragged saturation state falls below one, calcium carbonate put out there without any active biological mechanism will disintegrate. That doesn't mean an organism will die if it goes to 0.95. It means all they have to put in their energy into continually recalcifying because they're working against the natural background. A, most organisms, you have to be up at about 1.7 before you're not stressed. These are numbers out of our bite-wide regional monitoring program. If you're up in the surface waters, no problem. You have a lot of um, oxygenation from algae, and you don't have a lot of CO2 built up. You get into the deeper waters, we are already in a bad spot, and on a declining bad spot. We are really right at the beginning for how we're gonna deal with this. The state has come out with, interestingly enough, an OA action, and that's put the slide. I couldn't find this. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. <laughs> uh, they have also today, you know, if you can find out this literally is today, um, they came out with their proposal, their final proposal for what they're going to do in the um, in the uh, triennial review of the ocean plan, the state water board did. And the number four issue was we have to deal with ocean acidification. But dealing with it, we have some really big issues. We don't have a management target. I just told you 1.7, not a bad number. Is that our target? That's one guy's opinion on a few species. We have to get to the point of identifying what those critical thresholds are we don't have. And then management actions. One of the things that's in the ocean action plan is that we should put out more kelp and more seagrasses because they'll suck up CO2, they'll sequester it, and you'll have less acidification. How much does that work? We're just beginning to do the experiments to go after. So what are the things that SCORP's working on? Three things. One, we have a regional monitoring program. Any of you are aware of what we call the BITE regional monitoring program. As part of that, we've added acidification in as a big part, not just the chemical part of acidification, like what's the pH, but also we have a scanning electron microscope where we're taking critters and we're looking to see, are their shells in good shape? Is there a difference in the condition of the shell in the deep water versus the shallow water, in San Diego water versus Santa Barbara waters? Um, so we're trying to get the finger on the pulse. But the bigger things that we're doing are laboratory experiments to determine organism sensitivity. How do you go about assessing what are the critical numbers? And I will tell you, it's not easy. What has historically been done by scientists is, oh, I slap an organism into pH 8.1 water, into pH, pH 8.0 water, pH 7.9 water. Okay? Problem is, in the real world, it doesn't work that way. What you get is these diurnal cycles that go on. Okay? And I will tell you that one of the things that motivated one of our most recent experiments is we're working with the people of Computed Sound that are doing exactly the kind of kelp planting and looking at within a kelp bed and outside a kelp bed to how the chemistry changes. And what happens is um, you get this kind of cycle. But wait a minute, you still get the same cycle, it just moves up a little bit. 
What are the critters most sensitive to? The average, the lowest number, the longest duration of, you know, the lowest number at the duration of at least four hours? We don't know. So we're built out, in fact, I don't, we didn't really set up a tour, Lori. Um, we built a new laboratory that does what we call dynamic exposure. It allows us to independently operate a, 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 a CO2, basically acidification, oxygen stress, temperature stress, and salinity. So that we can do this kind of mimicking what we find in the environment, plus we can do it independently because they often interact. So when you have these kind of changes, what's affecting the organism the most? Is it oxygen stress? Is it temperature stress? Is it acidification stress? So we can run this curve, but then rerun it where we kept oxygen the same. Rerun it where we kept salinity the same. So it's kind of a unique facility. That's one of the focal points that we have right now. The other place that we're looking is ocean chemistry models. One of the debates is um, how much are the local inputs that you get from nutrients and carbon um, affecting local conditions? And would managing this make a big deal? In that ocean action plan, it specifically calls out the idea that if we reduce nutrients, then we'll reduce the amount of, um, of algae. If we reduce the amount of algae, we're removing the amount of dead algae and therefore we reduce the, reduce the amount of um, CO2. That will happen. Will it happen by affecting it 0.1%, 1%, 10%? You're gonna go spend billions of dollars to remove nutrients, you better know that. So in a sense, these are two opposing views that are out there. One, we get a lot of nutrients coming from upwelling, everything we put in from local inputs is small, doesn't matter, inconsequential. The other is, you got a bad day, don't make it worse. Cut back on the nutrient inputs. So how are we attacking that? By doing ocean modeling. In essence, we're building what we call a coupled physical biogeochemical model. What happened is the physical part is when, say, an ocean outfall comes in, um, it's not going to stand still, all right? And it takes a while for the nutrients to have those effects. If that happens, and it takes, let's say, 30 days to happen, and that water's halfway to Hawaii, then the local inputs are really not having much effect because it's going to be diluted at that level. On the other hand, if it happens more quickly and it happens right in a local area, the water. So what we do is we build a couple of physical biogeochemical up. What you're doing is you're taking these cells, 66 million cells, and you're incrementing them in 15 minute increments. So look where the mortar moves and how quickly the, acid or the nutrient uh, dynamics takes place. Um, that allows us to predict what the, uh, what the effect is because we can now run the model by saying, what happens if I remove that input by 10%? What if I remove it by 20%? What if I shut down the, let's see, just trace it. What if I shut down the Hyperion plant and run it all through uh, LA County's plant? We can play all of those what if games that allow us to say, what are the management options? How much difference would it make? Um, it's one of our biggest research investments at the moment because from a management decision, this is a huge management decision. Uh, and so, again, we're building tools. We don't make the decision because let's say it comes out as it makes a 2% difference. Somebody has to determine is that big enough or small enough? That's our decision. But our job is to say, this is the amount of change under these kinds of scenario conditions. Uh, just so you know, some other uses of the model, once we build this model, since we've got a bunch of engineers who all like playing what if scenarios, there's all kinds of other things we're going to be using the model for. One of them is vulnerability assessment. One of the things that the Ocean Protection Council is focused on is which areas are most vulnerable to change, which areas are least vulnerable to change. We have something called the marine protected areas. Um, how do you want to use marine protected areas? Do you want to put them in the areas that have the most change anticipated because you want to build up essentially something that's adapting to change? Or do you want to protect the areas that are going to change the least because you want to preserve the, the critters right now? I'm not sure which is the right strategy, but the model will tell us which habitats are going to change the most uh, at that one rate. Uh, mitigation assessment, I talked to you about kelp. What we're doing is experiments to say, how much does kelp matter in this space? But when you go to look at it in the big picture, you need to know how many kelp of that size and spacing do you need? if you're going to be effective. The model allows you to essentially plant kelp in, into the model and say, if I had kelp there, how much difference would that make on a regional scale? Um, while we're doing that, we're also doing things like tracking ocean inputs. Right now, one of our projects, again, it's a physical model as well, 
A lot of people are really worried about plastics. It has nothing to do with climate change, uh, but we're using that to track plastics. Um, and then some of you, again, I put this in because we've got engineers who probably work on this stuff, as you start to consider outfall changes, outfall changes of moving an outfall, outfall changes in particular of taking plumes and making them den more dense plumes uh, because you're doing a lot of reuse, um, how's that going to change the circulation? So the models actually help with a lot of things. Second topic I promised to talk about is hydrography. Um, as you have climate change, you're going to change rainfall patterns. You're going to change snowmelt patterns. Um, you're going to change temperature. That's water pools that might have been there um, too warm, they, they dry up. So essentially the refuges during the drier periods have the potential to go wet. This is at the same time we're getting changes in our demand portfolio because we're going to a lot of reuse. As you go to reuse, you no longer put as much water back into the stream. Essentially, the artificial um, uh, streams uh, start to go away. Uh, conservation. Uh, all that means is that we now need to start defining what are acceptable flows. And the state is working towards how they do that. We're helping with that. Uh, when you do it, a lot of people think about it as, oh, it's just like minimum flow. Well, no, it's actually much more complex than that because if you look here, different critters require different periods when they are flow sensitive. Right? And it's not just the minimum flow, it's the variability of flow, it's the duration of flow, it's the, do you get the whooshing flows that wash things out? Um, um, so minimum flow is part of it, but it's only, actually turns out to be a relatively small part of it. How do you put all this together? And from a management's perspective, where does this come in? The biggest place it's coming in is the State Water Board has a very interesting paradox in front of it. It says, I want to do more reuse. I want to, I want to do actually more stormwater capture. I want to put less water into streams. Oh, but wait a minute, I want to protect those streams. Uh-oh, how do you do that? Um, and so um, if you are um, wanting to do a reuse application where you no longer put as much water into the stream, you have to put in what's called a 1211 change position, basically saying, I, I want to put less water in and it won't harm the stream. That presents an interesting problem, particularly in the Los Angeles River, because in the Los Angeles River, you actually have three facilities that have either already or are planning to put in 1211 petitions. So first off, we don't know what is the number you can go down to yet. And then who goes first? Is it first come, first serve? Is it equal among them? Very interesting set of challenges, but it starts with you can't have a second question until you have the answer to the first question. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're working on. And of course, it becomes even more complicated when you consider dam operations. Um, and you look at all the dam operations that you have going on uh, in that system. So very complicated, but again, it kind of starts with understanding the science of how much flow the critters need and what aspect of flow that they need. Um, I promised to only go for about 15 minutes, so I'll stop there by saying, if I have more time, I'll tell you what we're doing with sea level rise and wetlands um, and things like water temperature and harmful applicants. And with that, I don't know whether we're taking questions or not. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I failed to mention we're going to hold off questions till the end. We have a panel up here, we'll have discussion at that time. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. That was a really interesting presentation of things that, you know, every time somebody talks about climate change, they're talking about sea level rise and some of these other factors were, were, were quite interesting. So, but somebody's looking at that. Anyway, our, our next speaker uh, is from, uh, formerly from the sanitation districts, Mr. Jim Stahl. Uh, Jim is a registered professional engineer in California and a board certified environmental engineer in the academy. Uh, he's also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, he's recently been appointed and confirmed as a member of the Regional Water Quality Control Board Los Angeles region. It's quite an honor. Thank you, Jim, for representing us there. Uh, anyway, Jim is uh, president of uh, JFS Environmental Engineering. He was former chief engineer and general manager of the County Sanitation Districts Los Angeles. He has extensive experience in planning, design, operation, and management of very cost-effective and environmentally sound wastewater collection and treatment systems. Uh, of course, part of that is water reuse and solid waste, which 
sanitation districts has been at least a pioneer in, in those areas. Jim received his BS in civil engineering from Loyola Marymount University. He's one of our alums. We're very proud of him. And an MS uh, in environmental engineering from Stanford. Jim? Thank you, Joe. Uh, that's a kind introduction. Um, I can't tell you what an honor it is to be part of this uh, this event this evening, the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists or something I truly believe in, but I'm going to take 15 minutes and at the end I may give you some of my musings on the, the advantages of the Academy. Uh, but, but, but having said that, uh, I was looking at the panel and I was thinking to myself, this old horse is in the barn every day uh, and I'm with these thoroughbreds who are out on the track, uh, and I really would enjoy it. Uh, uh, so, so I appreciate you very much being part of, uh, of this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I, I learn an awful lot every time I hear Steve speak in terms of what's going on. Uh, as an engineer, you love graphs and data. Well, I'm going to get into policy with you because uh, I want to really talk about my position on the regional board and, and uh, what the regional board has done from the standpoint of uh, a client adaptation. Uh, when Wendy first asked me, she said, I want you to speak about adaptation. And I thought, well, are you talking about me adapting to my new position in the board <laughs> or are you talking about climate? Uh, as far as the new position is concerned, it's been very challenging. I enjoyed very much a great staff. Uh, I've only been there for a few months, so uh, maybe as they say, uh, I'm still on the honeymoon. I'm the only engineer on the board, and I don't know whether I should say I'm proud of that or, uh, or just exactly how that's going to work out. But the, the, the board members themselves are very great to work with. It was an honor that Jerry Brown appointed me and certainly that, uh, that Kevin News uh, Governor Newsom and the uh, and the legislature uh, confirmed me. Uh, as far as the actions of the regional board uh, on climate uh, adaptation, it goes back to about 2014 when they first uh, began to consider it. I'm showing you a document here of April 2019, and it's really a framework for uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation, and it evolved from um, it, it evolved from work that was done in 2014, where the board felt that it was absolutely necessary to get out in front of this. I don't know, in 2014, you're saying you're getting out in front of climate change, but, but the fact of the matter is it needed to be addressed. And they held, uh, as, as the board would uh, have a tendency to do, and I think rightly so, held a lot of public meetings, got input. As I'll show you in a minute, Steve was involved in this too. Um, and, and that, uh, that led to this, this uh, final document after they put out a, 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 a first uh, document on the adaptation. Um, they, they really, uh, the original board felt that they needed to achieve the following goals. And there are six points here. And I would, I would like to bring out points two, three, and four. And I'll show you later why I feel that way. Uh, part of it is probably being an engineer. The other part of it is point two. I think Steve was talking about storm surges. It makes only sense. You're going to protect the infrastructure you have. But to me, it's so important. I don't know whether I'd use promote as advanced groundwater recharge and water recycling. I don't want to sound like a commercial. It is an absolutely essential part of, uh, of securing our water supply into the future and, and certainly an important part of uh, of adaptation as far as climate change is concerned. And the same thing goes, goes with the third point in pr promoting a sustainable uh, watershed approach. Uh, as part of the development of this framework, uh, the regional board, to their credit, felt that they needed to be guided by some science, some data input. And they first went to UCLA to be able to develop precipitation models for them and certainly to talk about temperature. Uh, and they used that data in engaging Steve in preparing this report on the vulnerability of, of stream biological communities in LA and, and, and Ventura County. And they used those results to come up with that uh, final document in April of 2019 
that set forth these these uh, strategies. Uh, you may not have caught the fine print on the slide that I showed you, but it said that this was a document for discussion purposes and uh, there are no requirements that have come out of it. Well, it turns out that there was a requirement that came out of it, and I think uh, an, an important one, and that is that discharges are required to prepare a climate change effect vulnerability assessment and mitigation plan, a climate change plan. I think most responsible agencies, and certainly the ones in this room, uh, were way ahead of that and realized that it was necessary for them to have an action plan that protected their facilities as well as addressed major issues in climate change. Nonetheless, this is written into the permits. If you want to see the specific language that's written into it, for those of you that might be involved with agencies that are going to be uh, facing this kind of uh, of demand, and as I say demand, but it's important that, that it be done uh, on the regional board's agenda for forthcoming board meeting next month. There is uh, uh, a requirement on an amendment to waste discharge requirements in the NPDES permit for Simi Valley. And so you can go on to the board site and uh, you can see just exactly what that language is. And if there's uh, I don't know whether I'd say criticism, but if there's one thing that I, I would uh, like to see change uh, is that these climate change plans are going to be a, a requirement as the permits come up for renewal. I think climate change is so important that you ought to send a letter out to everybody in the, in the permitting community and say, be prepared for this. Uh, I personally feel that almost all responsible agencies, all agencies have already done this, but at least they should be prepared for the fact that in their permits, you, you are going to be seeing this. Now, while the regional board was doing all this, the, the state water resources Council was not silent. Uh, they were doing an awful lot from the standpoint of uh, action and stirring, for the department, stirring up the departments they had under them to, to address climate change. And in 2017, they put out uh, what their program was to be able to do that. We can't get into the details of that tonight. Time will allow that. But if you go on the State Water Resources Control Board website, you'll find all the reports and what they're requiring in the same way that if you go on the regional board site, you will, uh, you will find that. Now, uh, the other thing that I think is important and showed leadership from the standpoint of, of Governor Newsom and certainly Governor Brown before him. Uh, the first slide that I showed you, I said I wanted to emphasize the second, third, and fourth bullet items, and the third and fourth related to groundwater recycling, groundwater recharge to water. Governor Newsom recently, and you probably saw this in the paper, signed in April 2019, he put out a water resiliency plan and he has a number of bullets in there when you can read it, especially oriented towards uh, one tunnel instead of two and investigating the Bay Delta. Uh, if there's one thing that I, I personally use the word disappointed, but if, 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 if I had had any input into this, as I'm sure you would, there would have been a bullet item in, in here advancing or promoting uh, aggressively water recycling. And, and the management of groundwater basins from the standpoint of getting the water in and getting the water out. I think that's, throughout the state, I think that's ex extremely important. This is integrated with the California uh, Water Action Plan that Governor Brown had. And so from that standpoint, you could say, well, there's a tie there because in that plan, it did talk about water, re uh, water recycling. Now, the other element that came out of this is what, why do I need a water resiliency plan? And this is a simplistic slide for saying, this is why you need the plan, because there's gonna be 10 million people more in this state, if you can believe that, by 2050. At least that's the projection. In some ways, I think that that's a low number. It's gonna be five degrees warmer on average. And it means that there has to be water supply certainty. You know, it's that old adage, uh, water brings life, Sanitation brings uh, health and dignity, and that's why we're in this room tonight, because we're involved in, in both of those. And so while we need to have water supply certainty, 
I'm concerned at this particular point that it's more uncertainty than certainty. And so we need to work towards making sure that all the elements that are in the, the, the governor's water resiliency plan uh, are aggressively pursued as, as, as far as I'm concerned. The last thing um, are ongoing challenges. And I, I, you probably could, you could probably label this slide stalls musings. Uh, it's just things that, as far as I'm concerned, um, are affecting us today and are going to affect us into the future. If I had to do this slide again, I guess I should add ocean acidification uh, in terms of what, what Steve was talking about. But, but having said that, I, mean, I realize that there are arguments on both sides of it. And the thing I'm the most confident of and proud of us to have been part of the SCORP organization over the years and the founding of it a long time ago. Uh, in, in the 70s by John Parkers, the sand districts, Orange County sand districts, Rob, had really the foresight to say, we need to have scientific data to base our decisions. And so they went out and they did it. And quite frankly, they opened themselves up, opened themselves up to say, we're going to live with what the science tells us. And so that's why I think SCORP is so important and has survived to this day. But going through these really quickly here, constituents of emerging concern. And these are the ones that are hot for today, but I guarantee you with the ability to detect, now we're down to parts per trillion, we're getting closer to the point where you're detecting it to atoms. I mean, if you look at the line in terms of what we're going to be, where does, what does that all mean? But when it hits the headlines of the LA Times and papers throughout uh, California and talking about PFAS, uh, you know, per and poly uh, fluorine alkaline substances, the floral alkaline substances, the forever chemicals, uh, extremely important when, you, when you're talking about the state of California now having action levels of five milligrams per liter or uh, five milligrams per liter at wish, but five parts per trillion. And we're not even to a, a, an MCL yet. This, these are big deals as far as I'm concerned and the impact that it will have on water recycling and, and water reuse. The same thing with microplastics. People like to say, well, we'll remove it and then we'll put it in the brine. Well, I, I, I don't, that needs to be addressed. And that's going to be one of the issues into the future as to, as to, as to brines and, and the treatment of brines. Same thing with biosolids. Water reuse, uh, Tracy, is going to talk about their program, the next program in that period, I'm sure, MWD and the Sand Districts, Rob and their partnership uh, with, uh, with Orange County Water District. Uh, it, it's just pioneering in all of these. But we need to still be aggressive, keep the foot, keep the, the pedal down to the floorboard, so to speak, in pursuing the water reclamation and important. In, in pursuing water reuse. An important part of that are, is the development of the raw water augmentation regulations. And I worry, while they, they say that they're going to be completed by 2023, I worry that the first, two, the first line in terms of PFAS and microplastics is going to result in a woe. And so you don't have the raw water regs, and, and then you have issues. And PFAS has to be addressed because, uh, you know, Orange County. The uh, water district will remove PFAS and RO, but are they going to put it in a groundwater that's already contaminated with PFAS? And then how are they going to be able to get it out? So these issues are going to try. Stormwater, MS4, that's an LA region issue, but MS4 permits, municipal uh, storm stormwater sewer system permits, where in essence you're trying to capture and treat stormwater, uh, and it tell you this, but in Orange County, same thing as in LA County, when it rains, it is a big deal. But still MS4 and the capture of that precious resource has to be looked at. Uh, I can't talk about it now, but it, it's involved in a lawsuit between the cities and the regional board. With regard to this, cost is, is an important part of it. Mayor W was passed by two thirds of the voters in LA County, and it's gonna fund 300 million a year. Actually, the county gets their 10% for management, so maybe it's about 203, 275, 300 million dollars a year forever in perpetuity. There's no sunset. 
And the reason I bring it in here is because my personal feeling is that money should go towards stormwater. The act and the reason that people passed it was because it says clean water, safe water. My concern is it's going to go for things that are not quite as cost effective and support projects that give you the, in essence, don't support projects that give you the big bang for the buck. And then the last thing, and I could go on about this forever, in my mind at least, is cost is important. The, the idea that people can say that I don't care what it costs, just do it, is not where society is and where we ought to be, where you ought to be as good engineers and scientists. Cost is important. It matters. Uh, collaboration and communication, I think, have to replace command and control. It, 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 it's, it's absolutely essential that you do that. So I've gone over my 15 minutes, I think, but uh, I appreciate your attention. I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Jim. It's mind boggling especially number one, the CDCs and the PFAS and CSOA and the news. And once it gets out, the public just goes crazy. They don't understand it. So we could spend the rest of the night talking about subject number one. Thank you. Our next speaker has spoken uh, at our seminars before. We are very honored to have her back. It's Tracy Minamidi. She has uh, she comes to us from the city of Los Angeles. She is the Chief Operating Officer for the City of LA, LA Sanitation, an organization of approximately 3,500 employees with an annual revenue of over $1 billion. In this capacity, she assists the GM by maintaining department-wide oversight of operational activities in a program that consists of three core services, wastewater treatment and water recycling, solids resources, and watershed protection. Her main areas of focus are in wastewater treatment, water recycling, and biosolids management, where over 450 million gallons in a day are collected and treated. Tracy has been with the LA Sanitation Environment for over 30 years and has previously worked with the City's Department of Water and Power and the Irvine Ranch Water District, serving in other capacities, including water planning, industrial pretreatment, and environmental regulations. Tracy holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Cal Poly Pomona, <laughs> a Master of Science degree in Environmental Engineering from Loyola Marymount University, and certification in Executive Management for State and Local Government from Harvard University. She is also a licensed professional civil engineer in the state of California and a board-certified environmental engineer of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists. Tracy currently serves as a board director for the California Association of Sanitation Agencies and served as a member of State Water Resources Control Board Advisory Panel for Direct Potable Reuse. Tracy will discuss the City of Los Angeles Resiliency Plan for 100% Recycled Water. Please help me in welcoming Tracy Minamita. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to be respectful of everybody's time, so please forgive me if the pace seems a little bit fast. I think I got too many slides in here. Um, but thank you very much, Lori, for that introduction. Um, I was asked to talk about, from the resiliency perspective, um, what is the City of Los Angeles water recycling program? So that's the part I'm going to focus on um, this evening. And just to start out kind of grounding everybody, this is a little bit about our background here. Um, City of LA, we serve 4.7 million people. Uh, we have 600 square miles, um, over two service areas. Uh, 29 contract agencies, they contract with us for sewer service. Um, our first service area is Hyperion. There we go. Okay, so Hyperion service area is the upper part of the City of Los Angeles. We have two upstream water reclamation plants. So I'll talk a little bit about Tillman Water Reclamation Plant, LA Glendale. Um, uh, they discharge their solids back into the sewer system down to Hyperion for solid treatment, um, and we recycle and beneficially reuse the water here. Um, we also have our Terminal Island service area down here that serves the Wilmington-San Pedro uh, communities. 
6,700 miles of sewer lines, 47 pumping plants, uh, about $1.2 billion program for our O&M and our capital. Um, and out of the 3,500 employees in sanitation, about 1,400 um, actually support the clean water program. And that's our wastewater treatment, collection, and water recycling program. <coughs> okay, so, um, you know, climate change and adaptation is something that is newer, at least in my 30-year career, but I wanted to just talk a little bit about the history of what we've done here um, in, in the city of Los Angeles when you talk about water recycling. So we go back, coming up on 50 years now, with our first plant coming online in 1996. That's our Los Angeles Glendale plant. Um, in 1985, we brought online Tillman, phase one. So that was the first uh, 40 million gallon a day um, tertiary treatment plant in the San Fernando Valley. Um, in 1995, uh, Hyperion partnered with West Basin Municipal Water District to start sending them some of the secondary effluent from Hyperion to West Basin, and they did continued uh, tr treatment for recycling. Um, 1991, we mirrored, doubled um, the size of our Tillman plant, so that brought us up to a capacity of 80 million gallons. And in 2002, our Terminal Island Water Reclamation Plant installed its uh, phase one of advanced water purification. Um, finishing that up and rounding it off in 2017 with the second phase, which was another 6MGD, bringing us up to full advanced water purification of 12 million gallons a day at um, Terminal Island. So bottom line here, just a summary of the, the four treatment plants, and if you focus on the total, at the bottom there, just wanted to, to, to bring up that our average flow, 333 million gallons a day, 117 MGD are recycled or beneficially used. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. That comes to about 35%. Um, we, we have a ways that we can go. There's still a lot of that water there that uh, was at 65% that is not beneficially used. And that's the water that we have at Hyperion. Um, Hyperion's effluent is secondary treated water. Um, the part that we don't send to West Basin for water recycling is discharged um, to Santa Monica Bay. So that's where we see a lot of potential. And I'm, I'm also going to talk a little bit about our Tillman Water Reclamation Plant. Okay, so focus here, these are the upstream plants. Um, I should say are the smaller plants. Tillman, we have a lot going on, and I, and I spoke about it uh, last year. Um, but just as a recap, uh, this plant uh, treats 32 million gallons a day. Uh, Steve had a, a, a good point here. This is one of the treatment plants that is being um, studied as part of the Los Angeles River flows and what kind of or what quantities um, of recycled water need to be maintained in the river to support its habitat. Um, but what we're proposing to do is start with a 10 MGD uh, demonstration project for ozone treatment. So the thought here is we'll take our current tertiary treated water, um, send it through some ozonation, help break down those microorganic chemicals, the big macro ones, um, so that when it goes to the spreading grounds, it will be better able to be assimilated through the soil aquifer treatment. Um, and then that water can be used as, as groundwater and pumped up as drinking water. Um, so the proposal here, we currently have it under construction um, by, here we say 2019, the end of this year, probably more like spring, we should have that up and running. And what it's doing is it's allowing us to start putting that water into the spreading basins as we are working towards full implementation of um, advanced treatment uh, at, the, excuse me, at the plant. Um, for those of you in the industry, we've been doing a lot of research. Last year, I spoke about some of the, um, uh, I should say, other than traditional treatment methods. So we were talking about using ozone and biologically activated carbon. Um, but what we decided in partnership with the uh, Department of Water and Power is that we are going to go forward with the full advanced treatment traditional approach. And that is because we have seen the opportunity now where instead of just spreading, 
We also want to consider the opportunity to do um, injection, groundwater injection, and that does require by current regulations that you have the traditional full advanced treatment. So we will be um, allowing for space, also considering uh, direct potable reuse in the future. So we may be including um, ozone and biologically activated carbon on the front end, so we're, we're allowing for that as a future possibility. Um, but right now we're focusing on 17 million gallons a day um, using fat treatment. Um, the plan is to have that up by 2025. We continue at our LAG plant treating 14 million gallons a day. 100% um, of that water is recycled and beneficially used. A portion is used through our tertiary treated uh, purple pipe system for landscape irrigation and industrial use. And a portion of that is discharged to the LA River, another one of the treatment plants that Steve is looking at, um, uh, to support the recreational uses and the um, habitat along the river. Terminal Island, we're, we're um, very happy about this plant. Full advanced treatment, um, it's one of the few treatment plants that actually starts with raw wastewater, goes all the way through the wastewater treatment process, and then through the advanced water purification um, at one location. So um, we've gone through a lot of optimizing, we've learned a lot, we've had some bumps along the road, but we're in a really good place right now. So we're very excited about that project. Okay, so here's, here's the big deal. Um, in February, Mayor Garcetti had a big press event and a big announcement we were discussing over dinner about, okay, the mayor said we're going to be zero discharge from Hyperion, and those of you in the industry know that you can't really be zero discharge because you have brine that needs to go somewhere. So we say 100% water recycling, and by, by that, it's understood that there, there is a brine um, that is a, a, a resultant of the treatment process. So um, that would continue to go uh, into the Santa Monica Bay. Um, but this is part of the Green New Deal. It's the sustainable city plan that the Amera put out. Um, and, and these are the goals basically that we want to store 70% of our water locally by 2035. Right now we get water from NWD. We get water from the LA Aqueduct. Um, and that's not really a local source. So a big part of having local water is for us to do water recycling. And also, we want to recycle 100% of all of the wastewater uh, for beneficial reuse by 2035. Um, some of the milestones here that we started with are that we are, are going to be producing 1.5 MGB of recycled water for use at LAWA. That means LA World Airports, meaning LAX Airport. Um, and uh, at Tillman, I just spoke about the project there, 17 million gallons a day uh, with the potential to go up to 25 MGB for groundwater recharge. Okay, um, the Advanced Water Purification Facility at Hyperion. Um, it's a small, small plant, so we're sizing it at 1.5 NGD. We're going to advance treat the water. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the treatment train, um, but we're going to advance treat it. It's gonna be used as LAX and really for uh, Title 22 purposes. So we're, we're gonna give it better quality than what it needs to be, um, but our perspective is, one, we want this to be a proof of concept, so we want to learn from this for our full scale at Hyperion, and also, because we're talking about the airport, we want to make sure that this is the best quality of water for everybody that's coming in to see LA and to visit with us, um, so, so it's important that we have the best quality water um, that, that can be um, produced. Potentially, we could expand it to 5 NCD. And as I said, uh, we want to demonstrate this as a proof of concept. The other project that we are working on is membrane bioreactors. Um, right now, Hyperion is um, pure oxygen, high purity oxygen. And um, in order to go to recycled water, we, we really need to look at uh, nitrification, denitrification process. And we're looking at use, utilizing an MBR process. Um, these membrane bioreactors are, the big benefit for us is that Hyperion is very space constrained. We have 144 acres, we call it about the same size as Disneyland, and it's more fun than Disneyland. <laughs> um, but there's no extra space, we're pretty, we're built out, and there are things that, there are facilities that we no longer use, um, but, the, but everything else we're using, and so, um, the, 
the membrane bioreactors are going to allow us to um, fit in uh, the treatment trains that we need for advanced treatment um, within the space limits that we have. Um, the uh, pilot is also going to give us a lot of good design data that will uh, allow us to uh, plan and do the design uh, for the full project. And it will allow us to start early with the regulatory agencies um, in date gathering the data that is going to be used to, one, design the project, and two, well, we obviously have to be permitted. Okay, um, the projects are both underway. We have contractors work, working on both the um, Advanced Water Purification Facility and the MBR pilot. Um, as I said, we're going to be getting data from that pilot that's really going to help us establish design parameters for the full project. Um, we're going to be working with the state and with the Division of Drinking Water um, on the permit process. And um, as I was saying, it's going to, going to be a massive effort um, to retrofit the plant on such a tight space and keeping in mind, of course, that we're running on a 24-7 basis, so we can't shut the plant down um, to do any kind of construction. We've got to figure out how to keep it running uh, while we're tearing some of the facilities down and putting in new facilities. So that is a, a really big challenge. Our cost estimate, uh, very roughly, is $2 billion, but I wouldn't be surprised if it turned out to be $3 billion. So, and that's just for treatment, um, not to mention the distribution system. So when you talk about distribution as well, it's uh, estimated in the range of about $8 billion. Okay, I think I talked about most of that. Um, and one more. Okay, so some of the main points really, as far as the MBR pilot goes, um, the pilot plant is going to be one MDD inside. We plan to have it up and running by April of 2021. Um, we're looking at three membrane bioreactor vendors. We pre-qualified and we're going to be seeing uh, what kind of data that we get out of each of those. So that will give us some direction when we get to the design phase of the project. Um, our feasibility report to be completed by December of uh, 2022 with the final uh, independent advisory panel report in January of 23. Our advanced water purification facility in conjunction with setting up this pilot, we're, we're doing construction and a design build for the AWPF um, that we plan to have online by May of 2022. So as far as the 100% water recycling and the ultimate advanced water purification facility, um, we'll be in good shape if we can finish that ER, EIR by December of 22. I really I think that's very optimistic. Um, complete design by 2024. That gives us uh, roughly 10 years to do the phase implementation to get us to the full recycling uh, by 2034 and then actually online by 2035. So I'm talking a lot about the, um, the treatment plant itself and the work we have to do within our fence line, but there's this whole other piece that's going on with our Department of Water and Power working on, okay, sanitation is going to produce that water, what are we going to do with it? So that's a, a, a whole other piece uh, that deserves its own time slot. <laughs> Um, just in another uh, graphic representation, what we have going on right now um, in 2019 is the water that I said we sent to West Basin, 35 million gallons a day, um, our MBR pilot in 2021, the Advanced Water Purification Facility to, um, for LAX by 2022, um, we'll have Tillman and its Advanced Water Purification Facility up by 2025, and then we'll be at full recycling by 2035. Um, very aggressive. Uh, I'm hoping to set, it, set us all up so that we can be there. I won't be there in 2035, <laughs> but uh, it, it's very aggressive. Um, we're going to be working really hard to try to, to, to meet that target. So lastly, um, balancing policies and priorities. And um, this ties in a lot with what, what both uh, Steve and Jim were talking about um, along the LA River. Um, you know, we want to increase the amount of water that we're recycling and reusing at Tillman um, and at LAG. The trade-off there is that if we pull more of that water out for reuse, then what happens to the LA River? So we have to balance that be 
because we know that it is important to support the recreational uses of the river and the habitat. And on top of that, it's another one of our mayor's goals to revitalize the LA River. So there's definitely a balance there that we need to find. Um, as far as Santa Monica Bay goes, this is what Jim brought out in terms of brine. We want to recycle all of the water that we have there at Hyperion to treat. But we recognize that with the current technologies that we're looking at, there are others that will give you less brine, but with the current technologies that we're looking at, we will have the concentrated brine that ends up still going out into Santa Monica Bay. And we still will have a permit, and we will still be re able or required to meet those limits. And then we're going to be placed with CEC <laughs> and PFOS and everything else on top of it. So again, how do we balance? You know, the, the one perspective is, well, that just means we, we recycle less water, so our brine isn't as concentrated, so we can meet our limits. But that kind of defeats the purpose, right, of trying to maximize recycled water. So that's definitely a challenge, and uh, we're going to have to work hard to see what we can do um, to make things better in that regard. As far as process efficiency goes, um, I think it was you, Jim, that mentioned 2023, right? Regulations um, for direct potable reuse um, are going to be in place uh, by the state. Those are stricter water regula regulations um, with the PFAS coming in. We're gonna we're gonna most likely be challenged by by um, needing to have higher levels of treatment. So what's that going to entail? Um, the other aspect is energy efficiency. How do we reduce our carbon footprint? Right. Well, currently we have a certain baseline, and if we put in these very high energy intensive treatment technologies, then we are increasing our carbon footprint, which goes against other goals that that we all want to to strive for in terms of um, adaptation and resiliency. So there are a lot of you know push and pull here um, on top of just the the engineering challenge of being able to do this. There are a lot of policy um, perspectives that we need to take into account and make sure that we um, address along the way. So it makes for a lot of uh, fun and <laughs> challenge. I met several um, students this evening and I'm so glad, and they're female too, um, to see that there there are you know young young students coming in here that are going to be the professionals working on a lot of these challenges and um, uh, it's so glad to see that. Um, Thank you, Professor Rackenberger. He was my professor back when I was at Loyola a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I learned so much. I learned so much in that program, and um, it really got me excited about uh, the work. The work that's out there to be done. So um, that's where we that's where we are right now. And I think I better hurry up and wrap it up. So thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for the uh, kind words. Seems like yesterday, though. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Robert Ferrante. He is the chief engineer and general manager of the county sanitation districts. Uh, it's kind of interesting. He, he reports to a board of directors like most general managers do, but his board of directors is comprised of the mayors of 78 cities, plus the board of supervisors. That's an almost impossible job. <laughs> anyway, uh, in his position, he oversees all of the departments and activities uh, of the complete district's operations. Uh, he's worked for the districts for 26 years in various roles leading up from wastewater operations, solid waste management, renewable energy, and air quality. And uh, Bob is also a board certified environmental engineer. He's got a BS in mechanical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley and an MS in Environmental Engineering from Stanford. Huh? Thank you. Thanks. It's a, a, an honor being here tonight, especially being on the panel with Jim Stahl, our, uh, one of our previous engineer, uh, chief engineers for the sanitation <coughs> district. Unlike him, I have an early bedtime, so uh, I'll get right into my talk. But one of the key components that I'd like to stress throughout the talk is the fact that there are going to be impacts from uh, climate change. But within those impacts, we need, as engineers, as scientists, we need to look for opportunities 
to use the infrastructure we have in the best possible way. And I'll give a couple of examples of things we're doing at the sanitation districts that take advantage of our infrastructure, our positioning to better handle climate change and the impacts from it. First of all, just a little bit about the districts. Uh, we basically handle the rest of the county that the city of LA does it for the most part. Uh, they serve about five million, we serve about five, five and a half million people. You can see we have uh, basically four separate systems and of course the biggest one is what we call our joint outfall system down in the lower basin. Uh, both Palmdale and Lancaster and the Santa Clarita area have their own systems as, as well. I will focus my talk basically on the, on the joint outfall system. All of these plants up here are water reclamation plants and 100% of the water is recycled, either beneficially reused or returned into the environment. Uh, and of course, just like the city of LA has Hyperion, we have the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant that takes the rest of the flow. It takes about 260 million gallons per day, which I think is similar to the flow at Hyperion, and it's then through a tunnel discharges off the coast. We also, the sanitation districts, as you heard before, we also do solid waste management, and I'll talk a little bit about the inner tie between our solid waste management side of the business. We do material recovery facilities, and also solid waste landfills. And in 2016, we added the ability to be a greater provider of stormwater management as well. Uh, and I'll talk about that nexus with our wastewater system in a little bit. But first of all, when we talk about impacts, we've seen the impacts and the impacts are real. This is a picture of our uh, main office at the Cal or what was our main office at the Calabasas landfill right off the 101 freeway. Uh, the fire uh, came through very quickly at the site. Uh, our employees at the site actually, because we have water trucks on site, were attempting to fight the fire on one side of the landfill, but because of the winds and the intensity of the flames, it actually came around the other side. Uh, we're very, very fortunate that no one was hurt uh, and everybody was able to get out. But uh, the next morning when we got in, our gas system was down, the, uh, most of the infrastructure, the gas piping and head headers were, a lot of them were melted and we had still a number of fires in close proximity to the landfill. So the uh, impact is real, even this past weekend, uh, with the fire up near Santa Clarita, uh, we had a pumping plant. You know the uh, utilities are curtailing power. In advance of the wildfires, we had a pumping plant that had to go on uh, emergency generator because the power was knocked out at that location. So what are the impacts? And I think, you know, Steve went over a lot of them. Uh, for a wastewater agency, of course, the storms are the big one, the amount of water we get. but more importantly, it's, it's intensity and when we get that water. We have been very used to, in Southern California, used to a, a dry season, a wet season, and the wet season has storms that are very predictable, they're widespread, they're fairly steady. You know, you can, you can really plan around that. But with climate change, and the key problem with climate change is you have this variability that's changing over time. So when you're looking at planning ahead, it's very difficult to do that. So for example, uh, you know, storms, you have now talked about atmospheric rivers, you have more thunderstorms. A couple of years ago, we had significant rainfall in August and September. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of impacts from maybe not a change in the total amount of water, but when it occurs, where it occurs too, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Drought is obviously uh, another one that we've experienced. We might be faced with longer droughts. Uh, the impact from that for a wastewater agency uh, is, is kind of strange. We've talked a lot about the receiving bodies, for example, the ocean and the chemistry changing there over time. Well, the drought has been a big uh, driving force in water conservation. So I think all of us as wastewater agencies have seen significant changes in what's coming into our plant. So, you know, 
15, 20 years ago when you were planning maybe your next uh, upgrade to your treatment plan or expansion, you knew what your inflow was, you knew what the population growth was, you know what your receiving body chemistry and biology is. Now you have a changing inlet uh, influence to your plant and you have a changing uh, uh, receiving body too. So that's part of the uh, impacts that we're seeing. I mentioned wildfires already. Uh, and of course, the key thing with wildfires, we got crews in into the site the day after the fire, but I never been in a location where it, it felt kind of surreal. You couldn't see more than a quarter mile or so. Your clothes and, and instantly smelled of smoke. The inside of your car is dead too. It was a tough working environment. And plus, there were still smoldering fires all around too. So you had kind of this fear of what happens if the wind kicks up. Uh, and so when we put our employees in those places, we need to be very careful that they have the power proper training, that they have the proper equipment to handle those uh, kind of conditions, and of course the proper safeguards so that everybody's safe. Indirect flows, I talked about the lower wastewater flows, so a lot of times we get the same concentrations or load, well, same loading of, of uh, waste in a smaller volume of water and the challenges with that. Uh, Ocean chemistry, I won't touch on the changes there. I think Steve did a great job of what we're seeing there and the fact that now you have an interplay between your discharge, whether it's toxicity or other issues, going into a changing receiving body. So theoretically, should you have different limits under different conditions or as things change over time? So those are, those are some of the challenges. Finally, I mean, it's pretty clear. Um, I haven't been as, around as long as uh, some of these people on the panel, but I remember 15 years ago, uh, people were really excited, environmentalists were really excited about natural gas being the bridge fuel. It's a great fuel. Let's get off coal and oil and go to natural gas. Now what do you hear? People don't even want to use natural gas. They're talking about electrifying, fully electrifying homes, new homes being fully electrified. So we are seeing these changes occur, and I know uh, that they will have an impact over time in, in terms of how we operate our facilities. So what are some of our responses that we're doing? And these might be minor things now, but they're already changes that we're making. During storms, as I mentioned before, a lot of times we, of course, monitored our sewer system, but we also monitored the flows at our uh, treatment plants. But now, with isolated thunderstorms at times, we need to really have a local focus on where those storms are, that our treatment plant may not see any additional infiltration into the sewers or a higher influent, but a local sewer might have a problem that leads to an overflow. Uh, also, construction projects, you know, they have to, contractors that are building, we're constantly doing capital improvements as our, our partners here, we constantly have to look at being prepared for stormwater conditions as well. And now if you have these rainfall events occurring outside of the regular times, you have to prepare for them, which ultimately increases the cost. Uh, I mentioned three, I, I won't talk any further about that, um, and, and uh, Tracy mentioned a little bit about modifying the plants to handle, uh, you know, the uh, going to advanced treatment and trying to do process uh, optimization. The key thing, too, about these new, more advanced processes is that they don't have the same tolerance as the old oxy oxygen plants. Uh, uh, that we used to use are just regular diffuse air activated sludge. So when you have your influent that's changing more over time, that is another issue that affects your treatment processes. The last thing you want to do is put something in and then realize five or six years later due to the changes in your influent, now, now it's not working. Or due to flow variations or water conservation, you have issues. Should have used equal, you know, flow equalization or or uh, other, some pick a different process. But I do wanna 
uh, talk about three different projects that we're doing. And this project is, is very similar to what Tracy talked about. It's just instead of the source water being Hyperion, the source water is going to be the Joint Water Pollution Control Plan in Carson. Um, we've always wanted to uh, have 100% recycling uh, at all of our treatment plants. The joint plant was always too salty. It has a significant industrial flow compared to our upstream plants. But with the new advanced technologies, we can remove that. And of course, it creates a brine, but we can purify the water and then use it. Uh, and the plan here, uh, some of you may have seen this before, we just had a grand opening for a demonstration, pro a small demonstration project in Carson at the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant. But the plan is to use that water to replenish groundwater basins throughout LA County, maybe even Orange County. And then as Jim mentioned with the raw water augmentation, is to potentially tie in that water into uh, the metropolitan system. They have their Raymet uh, water treatment facility up in the north here, and that's interconnected down here with Deemer as well. So it's a, it's a great system because it ensures that during droughts, we do have our groundwater basins uh, topped off as much as possible. Uh, Metropolitan actually did some work, and for the San Gabriel Basin, they went back and looked and said, if we had this project in place from uh, 2008, 2009, what would be the effect in the San Gabriel Basin that hit historic lows? The fact it would have stayed within its operating range with the additional water from this project. So that's the ability, as I think Jim mentioned too, that recycled water can bring to the region. Would it make it, uh, you know, a, a drought a thing of the past? I'm not sure, but it would definitely go a long way towards the resilience and the capacity of the area to withstand the long drought. So these next two projects are what I mentioned at the beginning. I, I, I promised you I talk about uh, seeking out opportunities even with negative impacts. So um, organics, organics going in, into a landfill. If a landfill is not well controlled, what happens? As that organic material breaks down, the methane escapes. Methane we know is what, 26 times more potent than CO2. See a lot of heads nodding, so I must be saying something right. But um, as a result, there's a lot of regulation on landfills. There's the goal to divert organic material from uh, landfills. I think it's 50% by 2028 or 2027. Big part of that is food waste. Food waste has a lot of energy. As a result, uh, it is a, a perfect feed for anaerobic digestion. So. We're an agency that does solid waste. We do wastewater. Uh, well, food waste comes in on the solid waste side, and it can go to the anaerobic digesters on the wastewater side. To the extent that our anaerobic digestion has excess capacity, we can utilize that food waste in there and boost our gas production and produce renewable uh, gas. So right now, we're up to uh, just under about 200 tons a day of food waste, and we bring that in in two ways. Some of it is this nice raw material that we then run through a treatment system and we make a slurry out of it that can be loaded into uh, 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 tanker trucks and taken directly uh, to our digesters down at our joint water pollution control plant. We also have large waste companies that collect their own and process their own and deliver that slurry directly to our uh, treatment plant in Carson. So this will allow us to produce additional gas. First, we hope to use it as uh, compressed natural gas in vehicles. We have a station, station adjacent to our treatment plant, and then ultimately we can inject it in the pipeline as well, and it will be renewable natural gas. And then also, as I mentioned before, our wastewater flows have gone down 25-30% uh, in certain areas since about 2000. 2007, that's great. People are really conserving water in inside the home, especially, that comes to our treatment plant. What does that mean? It means our dry weather, uh, during dry weather, our sewer system has what? It has a lot of excess capacity available to it. And 
the cities and the regional board uh, are uh, being faced with MS4 permit compliance for stormwater. And one way that uh, we saw a nexus is with, with uh, stormwater compliance is utilizing our excess capacity, not only in our sewer system, but also at our treatment plants to treat that water. So we, as early as 2002, 2003, developed programs where we would, uh, we partnered with LA County Public Works to divert their dry weather flows into our sewer system. The funny thing is, if you overlay a map of storm drains and, and overlay with the sewer system, you'll see that the pipes cross in hundreds of locations. And it just, it's a very easy thing to do during dry weather. We have that capacity. But we can always do more, right? And this carriage crest project is really a poster child for maximizing the amount of water that you can divert out of a storm drain, not only during dry weather conditions, but also during wet weather. So this is a project being done at the city of Carson. And you can see the, the waste shed that it's picking up from right here in this colored uh, section here on this graphic here. And the beauty of this project is the, um, the project's located right here in green. Our treatment plant is just a diagonally across the street. So what, what the project entails is diverting the water out of the storm drain into storage basins that then pump into directly into our one of our inlet sewers into the treatment plant. And since we are in close proximity, we're not worried. We, we have very good information on the level in that sewer. So we know that even when it's raining, if, if there's uh, capacity in that sewer, we can divert the water into the sewer. So not only can we do all the dry weather diversion, but we can maximize the amount of wet weather diversion as well during a storm. And especially, it's especially good, you know, the joint plant receives flows from all the way, you know, up in, in the foothills ultimately come down. So uh, when a storm starts, we have a lot of excess capacity for uh, the first couple of hours. So we can actually take potentially kind of a first flush out of that system, which of course contains most of the pollutants. So, and the idea then is with this type of project here, um, ultimately when we have a recycled water project with Metropolitan at the site, uh, we can be recycling that water too. So not only does it get cleaned and get, gets out of Machado Lake, uh, which, of course, the city of L.A. spent $110 million on just a couple of years ago refurbishing, but it gets reused as well. And one other thing is, you know, we, we've, we've talked a lot about uh, these projects, and, and, you know, the city of L.A. project is a great project. Our project, hopefully, is similar and is a great project. But hopefully one day, I don't know if any of you noticed, this little potential inner tie for pipeline from Hyperion. This is something that uh, hopefully the two projects can be put together even so that we create a, a system wide of recycled water and depending, we could even then coordinate in the future. If one's down, the other one stays up and then water can be sent to all of these, you know, locations, and if there's excess water, of course, this is why the raw, raw water augmentation is so important. That would then divert the need for uh, uh, imported water from uh, Northern California and the Colorado. So I'll end with that. I unfortunately probably went over 15 minutes, but uh, we'll see. Thank you, Robert. I visited your facility where you make the slurry a couple of weeks ago. It's pretty impressive. Looks you. like a milkshake. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Our next presenter comes to us from another organization very near and dear to my heart, and that's the Orange County Sanitation District, which is my current employer. 
Rob Thompson is the Assistant General Manager for OCSD, where he currently oversees the operations and maintenance and engineering departments. He previously served as the Director of Engineering. Rob came to OCSD in 1995 as an engineer in operations and maintenance. He has served in many capacities for OCSD, including Manager of the Process Controls Division, overseeing the maintenance, installation, and programming of OCSD SCADA system and programmable logic controllers. Engineering manager overseeing the instrumentation shops, electrical shops, and power generation plants, and engineering manager overseeing asset management and engineering planning. Prior to joining OCSD, Rob worked for the Ralph M. Parsons Company as a senior engineer and project manager on several major oil projects in Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, refinery projects in Philadelphia, and coordinated worldwide sulfur technology sales. Rob is a registered electrical engineer and civil engineer in the states of California and Washington. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical engineering from, guess where? Cal Poly Pomona. No problem. And Master of Public Administration degree from Long Beach State. Rob will discuss OCSD's climate, resiliency, and adaptation planning. Please welcome Mr. Rob Thompson. This is the second most difficult speech I've given today. I started the day with 120 maintenance and operations workers from our Huntington Beach plant and drove them through a 14-point presentation on our strategic planning efforts. So watching those poor guys in the orange shirts trying to... <laughs> This will be somewhat easier than that, I hope. So. I have a little bit more streamlined approach. It's, it's very um, focused on the climate adaptation work that we've been going through at the sanitation district. There we go. But the first question, I'm going to make sure everyone, I think you're all industry insiders, you know who we are. We are um, the wastewater provider for North Central Orange County, only 2.6 million people. Sorry, all of them. <laughs> we are not worthy. <laughs> but we do Disneyland, just to be clear. <laughs> and we are back here, I'm just saying. So thank you for joining us. As you use the restroom before hitting the road, please flush twice. <laughs> uh, that's who we are, that's what we do, plan one and plan two. Fountain Valley, all the water there goes to our partners, Orange County Water District. It is recycled. Oh, yeah, that little thing, GWRS. I can talk to you for hours. You've already heard it for hours. It's all good. Plan 2 in Huntington Beach is about to be um, hooked into that system. We're going through the work right now to take the last 30 million gallons of reclaimable water, bring it up to the plant, and get up to 130 million gallons by 2023. So that's GWRS. There are pictures of the treatment plants. Again, very happy. Um, <laughs> downstream of the actual Disneyland. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll let it go. Um, you'll notice there's an imbalance in the plants. They used to be very balanced in their flows. We're pushing more water toward our uh, Fountain Valley plant because that's where the reclamation is. Um, that's led to a lot of difficulty. Systems that were designed for that same 120 million gallon flow are now down to 65 million. We have a great outfall system to the ocean. We have a five mile outfall, 120 inch um, great outfall that was designed to do um, 480 MGD. So it's fantastic, except that during low flow, when all this is going on, we may see flows as low as 15 million gallons. So if you've ever seen a 3,000 horsepower pump, pump 15 MGD, it's really fast. <laughs> so what we've had to do is adapt. Um, this is a freebie, I, and I won't go over my time as far as you know. We actually have to build smaller pump stations to deal with that flow. So for all the things that we're all talking about, we're all adapting our facilities that were designed in the 50s, 60s, and 70s to be partial secondary, partial primary. And we're morphing them all the time and creating something that was never envisioned when they were originally designed. That's part of what we're talking about. So as we go through the planning process at OCSD, we're thinking about all the, the threats we face. Um, corrosion, that's yesterday's news. Everybody's got something going on there. Um, cyber attacks, I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer. I, I pay attention to the cyber attacks. Everyone is talking about how they're using IT and how effective and efficient it is. But with that comes a lot of risk, and you need to consider those risks. 
We're looking at the electrical grids, the power supplies. We'll touch on that a little bit. Um, like most, we have three versions of power. So in California, Edison Power, our own central generation plants from our uh, own methane gas and diesels in the event that all heck breaks loose and we, and we need extra power. But we're also dealing with droughts and floods. So in the same drought period, you may be seeing low flows, all the issues that go along with dirty um, uh, sewers and how you're dealing with the, the higher strength solids and then bang, in comes that one storm from an atmospheric river and you're at an all time high. So that 3000 horsepower pump, you still need all six of them. So we started this endeavor to look at climate. Now very specifically, we've looked at all of these risks. These are climate risks that we're gonna focus on because yes, we have to look ahead. We have to pay attention to the climate drivers. So we looked at all the work everyone else did. Uh, we live in a very conservative county it was interesting when we did our first presentation for directors, they, a couple of them lined up, okay, I get to go first. This voodoo science, this crazy, like, ah. We stuck with the, the published works. We didn't get into the business of trying to tell the world what uh, the underlying science is. That's for very smart people um, like yourself to deal with. I'm just trying to be a practitioner and not lose my job in front of the board of directors. <laughs> We looked at all these great standards. We made a decision to take the outcome of whatever we came up with and dial it into our construction plans. We have a very sophisticated plan for how we're gonna take care of what we own. Uh, our advanced asset management philosophy says we have these two treatment plans. Each of them is broken up into basically eight process areas. We have a plan to touch each of those process areas completely once every 20 years. They're all staggered out so that we can do the work, the cash flow works, our ability to deliver the work is in line. So over a period of 20 years, if we have a good idea of what we're trying to accomplish, we don't have to do a special program to take care of a flood threat, take care of a wildfire, take care of PFAS. We try and dial in every two years where are the needs going? What should we be looking at? And this study was one of several, including biosolids and others, that helped us re, um, replumb our plants. So we're looking at water reuse, we're looking at food waste, we're looking at um, constituents of emerging concern, we're looking at several items, and then we're seeing how that affects our entire treatment plants. So are there global changes we need to make to our headworks? I don't wanna make four changes to headworks, I want to make one change to Headworks. And by having many plans all coming together and a consistent plan to touch them, we can actually make big progress. So if we're talking about work that has to be done by 2050, no problem. I'm going to touch some of my uh, major treatment trains twice in that time and we'll um, incorporate those results. So the climate forces that we're really focused on were these five. When you get down to it, sea level rise and tsunami basically get down to, to flooding. Wildfires turned out to be not much of a problem for us in urban Orange County. Extreme heat was pretty much a non-player. We won't even talk about it. And I'll pro about all the things we do like everyone else to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. So we looked at uh, wildfire first. Uh, ironically, the biggest problem we found is transportation. If we need to get chemicals in, if we need to get biosolids out, there's a bigger chance of us losing uh, roads and trucks than there is of us actually being affected. The one caveat to that has become power. But again, I think we're well positioned uh, with power. We have been since the 1970s. We have our central generation plants, which give us about 80% of the power we could need, even at peak flows. Um, couple that with um, Edison. Hopefully it's not a total loss. We have double-ended feeds but then we also had diesel generators spread throughout. So we can survive power outage pretty well. But that gets us to the flooding. There's a bunch of ways you can have flooding. Um, king tides, they actually do exist. We see them now. They're sort of harbing, harbingers of things to come. Um, storm events are getting crazy. I'll talk about each of these in a little more detail. Tsunami and sea level rise. Interestingly enough, these are all photos. Everyone talks about climate change like it hasn't happened. It's been happening for a long time. 
Um, it's just recognizing that um, crazy years happen and we need to be ready. They do seem to be getting more crazy, as I'll talk about. <clears throat> so this is the more crazy part. My, my humble belief is what makes things worse for the sanitation district isn't so much that it's raining harder. It is raining hard, there are some big storms, but I think what's actually killing us is the plumbing codes. We do such a great job of environmental stewardship, everybody's answer is, if it's bad water, put it in the sewer. So in the good old days, 1960, you built a pool in your backyard, it was time to clean the pool out, where did you pump the water from your pool? That's right, you put it in the gutter where it belonged, and it went right down and it was all good. <laughs> all comes the plumbing code, whoa, 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 that needs to go to the sewer. And I'm sure all of you good pool owners have a valve to turn off the overflow to your pool when it rains. Come on. So little, little things like that start to occur, and what you see is what used to be a good 2.2 INI factor, hey, if I got 100 million coming in in a storm, I could get 220 million. Well, we're getting three. The last big storm we hit, we had an INI rate of three. And a lot of that, I believe, is people trying to do the right thing environmentally in the drought. We need to catch its water. Storm flow should go in. Well, not all that storm flow should go in. Luckily, we didn't have a spill, but those are the kinds of things that we need to pay attention to as much as anything else. But I digress. Flooding. Flooding is now just, this is your straight, it's raining, what's the flood map look like? This is a great map showing our risks, plant two in Huntington Beach is right here in that beautiful light green. And these are our Newport uh, Coast pump stations. You can see the ones along the bay especially are really near the floodplain. You start to build on things. So now you have a flooding threat, it's gonna rain. Oh, the sea level is rising too. So what, what's that mean? Um, again, being conservative Orange County, the sea level is rising. Why it's rising, I choose not to debate with you. I'm, I respect all points of view. It is, however, rising, and we need to adjust to that. So when you start to put the risks together, what does it look like with a sea level rise and a rainstorm? That's bad juju. Everything that now used to be high and dry is no longer high and dry. So that is the essence of what we're trying to figure out. So by the year 2070, again, I'm going to rehab all of my pump stations by then. I'll probably line most of my pipes by then. I have a capital mechanism to go about making change to mitigate this risk that has been identified by Hazen and Sawyer, and they're available after the meeting if you want to talk to them about how they can help <laughs> with this. Um, that's flooding. Sea level rise, they kind of go together. A whole other problem is the tsunami map. ASCE, our friends and, and brothers and sisters there, have come up with this brand new uh, version of ASCE 7, uh, 2016's version, and that has great new maps talking about tsunamis. So now we have this information and this need to deal with the tsunami risk that really never existed before for us. So it's just really another version of flooding, kind of. Is everybody familiar with tsunami threats and how they deal with plants like ours? There's really three problems. There's the flooding, inundation, we've all seen the pictures, when the waves in. But the first problem is really the force of the water hitting the structure that was standing there all by itself, minding its own business. So if it doesn't get knocked off the foundation, then it's flooded. Okay, that's good. The real problem is when the water comes out. So the force of the wave coming back um, has a certain velocity, a certain force. But the real issue now is not just that it's water, it's all the debris that got knocked off before and you're pulling all that debris against your structures. So in dealing with flooding threats from rain, from sea level rise and from tsunami, we started to look at how could we mitigate those problems all at the same time. So we looked at our facilities, Plant 2 in Huntington Beach, and our coastal pump stations. We used this great criteria for how we should begin to approach the problem. There's two ways to deal with it. Do you try and protect the whole facility, or do you just look at every item in the plant and see what's at a certain level, and okay, this push button needs to be waterproof, that motor needs to be submersion uh, rated, 
that MCC needs to be lifted four feet, or do you just build a nice moat? Well, all kidding around over, you build a moat. You don't rewire every three billion dollar piece of your plant in Huntington Beach. You don't worry about uh, re replumbing all the motors and all the push buttons in every pump station. What you do is you waterproof the pump station. Anybody been to Venice, Italy? It's a beautiful. When you go, I, I just was there and I was, we had this going on. And they had these great, they had these great little walls they put up everywhere in Venice because they get these king tides. They're just channels, stock blocks. You're walking along every doorway and Venice has one of those. So it works pretty well. So we looked at what we could do at one of our pump stations. So we get rid of hatches that would easily flood. We can replace them with a similar um, submarine style hatch. We, instead of trying to waterproof everything inside the doors, we just build a wall and, and make the whole station uh, rated for the level that we think is heading our way. It's a very economical approach. It's something that we can wait to do until we're ready to refurbish the pump station. Uh, that's all planned out. Every pump station has a project already budgeted, already cash flowed uh, in the next 20 years. Tank <laughs> 2 is a little bigger, 110 acres of pure fun. Uh, again, it is situated on the Santa Ana River along um, the, the Talbert Marsh um, on crappy soil. And we can talk about seismic. That's a whole other uh, boatload of fun. But by, by understanding that in 2070, we need a wall that's about 21, 22 feet tall from water level. We can get 90 something percent of the benefits for not only flooding, but also that tsunami threat. If the big tsunami comes up from the Pacific Ocean, which is right there, and heads toward our plant, by having that big wall, we can, we can mitigate a lot of the energy that would have come in that first surge. And then we can actually prevent the return water because we turn our plant into a big bathtub and we drain it out in a controlled fashion. So by being clever, we can protect ourselves from a flood, we can mitigate the tsunami, and have a pretty cool looking wall that's great for security that the city would never let us build because it's ugly. So, nobody's from Huntington Beach, right? <laughs> it's a pretty stout wall. Uh, it's a few million dollars, but it's certainly a lot cheaper than trying to replace every push button, low motor, um, anything like that. That doesn't mean we didn't do anything in the plant. We did come up with a standard which said for every new electrical room that's built, make sure every motor control center, every piece of switch gear is X number of feet off the ground. That's the height that we're looking at for flood protection. So over the period of years anyway, we're going to head toward a more resilient plant. Oh, and by the way, we'll have a cool security barrier all the way around. <laughs> so uh, we, the plan's really nice. It's very glossy, and it shows you each of the threats based by each of the pump stations in the plant. Um, again, flooding in the various forms being flooding, sea level rise, tsunami are prevalent along the coast. We have one um, pump station at Cal State Fullerton that we're going to abandon anyway. That would have been our heat threat. And wildfires are pretty much mitigated with our uh, very good, uh, robust electrical uh, distribution systems. We do a lot uh, to reduce the impact of global warming. We have um, water recycling is one of our main um, efforts to, to reduce greenhouse gas. We use a lot less energy to do GWRS and make that 100, 100 soon to be 130 million gallons available. Rather than having it imported from the Colorado River or down from the River Delta, we use about half the energy, if I remember correctly. Um, so all of those translate into greenhouse gas savings. Obviously, everything we do with our fleets, um, uh, a lot of uh, work in Syngen to, to take biogenic uh, matter, turn it into uh, uh, useful heat for digestion and energy for the plants. So a lot going on there. And... Thank you. I'm not sure whether you have Thank you, Rob. Very interesting. Well, our last speaker, uh, I'm going to talk about.
about wildfires, probably because I got invited because they've had the flames of the Woolsey fire at their doorstep. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mike McNutt. Uh, he's with the Las Virginias Municipal Water District in uh, Calabasas. Uh, uh, Mike is a native Ohioan and uh, was always in and around water, as he says, especially Lake Erie. Uh, he graduated with a B.S. in Environmental Science and a B.A. in Communications from uh, the Ohio State University. That's right. Uh, Mike has worked as a watershed manager for a number of nonprofits and health departments before becoming public information officer in emergency preparedness for the uh, City of Columbus uh, Public Health. Uh, at the height of the recent drought, Mike decided to get back into water and headed to California. So he came here in 2014, began his career at the Palmdale Water District, uh, then moved on to Metropolitan, and before finding his home in Las Virginis. Uh, Mike was uh, kind enough to uh, put together this presentation from somebody that's actually experienced it, and we can probably learn a little bit from the lessons learned uh, in dealing with the impacts of climate change. Everybody talks about wildfires. Mike's experienced it. Mike, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a true and honor to be here. Uh, there's so much brain power in this room. I feel like I'm becoming smarter just sitting here. <laughs> uh, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and share some of this information with you. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been in a wildfire before. All right, so nobody really. So that means that nobody has been at work or anything when a wildfire comes through before, right? How many people have been in an emergency operations center before? All right, so some of us have like, gone through like an actual disaster event or just like doing exercises. Earthquake. Earthquake. Okay. Okay. So um, moving to California, in Ohio, we have tornadoes, you know, stuff like that, right? But coming out here, it's just like, whoa, there's all sorts of stuff going on. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, as, as, um, as he was talking about, um, I, I've been here for about a year and a half at, uh, at Las Virgins Municipal Water District. And, you know, I didn't really think that, like, something like this was going to happen. But when I used to drive around, I'm like, wow, these, there could be a definite fire here. And I want to share with you sort of my perspective as to how this unfolded and some of the things that I learned and what our agency did to kind of just get through it. So, um, first of all, I'm not sure if, let's see, how do we, this one? Yes. Uh, Las Vegas Municipal Water is a full-service water provider. So if you want drinking water, we got it for you. If you want a flush or toilet, we'll take care of it for you. If you want compost made from biosolids, we'll get that to you for free as well. And we're also uh, expanding our already solar field to about 5 megawatts right now from a 1 megawatt facility. And with some of the upgrades we've made at our wastewater plant, we should be able to power that off the grid, if you will, uh, in the coming couple of years with the expansion of that five megawatt facility. Uh, our service area is about 122 square miles. Um, we are definitely way back when an early adopter of using recycled water back in 1972. That's when I was born actually. Um, all potable water is imported from Metropolitan District from up north in the Sierra Nevadas. And uh, as I said, we provide uh, sanitation services and wholesale where like recycled water through a joint powers authority we have with Triumph of Sanitation District. Um, this right here is actually the uh, Malibu Creek watershed boundary. And um, I'm going to overlay a couple of things here. Um, that is the blue shaded area is our potable service area. The lime green is our sanitary, uh, their sanitary area, but they, we combine both of those. So the whole area is uh, sanitation, but just the blue is the potable. And uh, why is this thing working? So here's, a, here's our wastewater treatment plant down here in the hills. And here's our composting facility just about two miles up the road in the Santa Monica Mountains. Uh, here's our uh, reservoir that we have up in Westlake Village that we use for a storage for our potable water. 
And then everything from, well, from Tapia, our wastewater facility, drains here to Malibu Creek at Surfrider Beach, actually, into Malibu Lagoon. So that's just sort of like our service area, so, so you get an idea of where we're located. So uh, November 8, 2018, so just not even a year ago, um, I remember this very distinctly because I actually was having, we have like a little place to eat lunch outside, so I'm sitting outside eating lunch with some of my colleagues, and I was like, man, you know, it's really windy out, and you know, I never experienced like sig significant wind like this on a regular basis, and I was like, this is pretty intense. And we already had word earlier in the day that over in Thousand Oaks, so, you know, a few miles away from us, like 12 miles or so, the hill fire broke out. And one of my colleagues that I work with uh, went home and she sent me some pictures and it was like right there in her backyard. I'm like, whoa, this is crazy, you know. And it's down the street and the winds are blowing and stuff like that. Uh, so there was a huge scene in a wind event. There was 50 to 60 mile per hour wind gusts. The, the, the winds gusting just were constant. And you could see those trees up there were just starting to bend. Um, at about 2.22 p.m., uh, Southern California Edison reported that they had an outage, and it was in the Chatsworth area at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, which is a whole Rocketdyne facility. And two minutes later, there was an, uh, a report of a fire started. So the Woolsey fire started literally on that premises from some type of electrical situation that happened from Southern California Edison. Um, as the, as, and then I was like I was saying, um, so the fire started, it took a little while before it got to the 101 freeway, uh, but we were hoping that that would have been a barrier, but obviously it wasn't. And so the hill fire was going on at the same time. This other fire started, and so resources within our area were obviously starting to get stretched really thin. So um, let's look at, I have a bunch of pictures I'm going to show you, so I don't have a lot of like words and stuff like that, but um, this is basically, it started on late Thursday, uh, and it started growing and growing and growing. And on Friday, um, it really was getting going. And I was in the emergency, we opened emergency operations center, uh, I believe it was uh, at 4, well, actually it was about 4 p.m. Uh, on that Thursday. So the fire was reported at about 2.22. By 4 p.m., we had to open up our emergency operations center at, uh, at the water district. You can see, generally speaking, that uh, at the end of the day, 295,000 people were evacuated. Uh, about 4.30 a.m. on the 9th uh, that the uh, fire jumped the freeway, the 101 freeway, and uh, you can see that uh, power outage at about 5.55 a.m., <clears throat> and you can see how many acres and structures were ultimately burned in three fatalities. These two pictures that I have right here, I wanted to share with you because this was at, uh, this was Friday morning, uh, very early as you can tell, and I was standing at our facility and uh, I was there when the power went out, it just went, and there was just nothing anywhere. It was surreal because there was no sound until the backup generators started coming on. Um, you could see this glow in the distance. It just started getting closer and closer and closer. And you could see um, about 5.55 here, I was standing right here. The 101s just were over here. And you could see this is probably almost when it jumped the freeway right here. And so when we knew this happened, we knew that it was just going to come through our service area. And so we were really, really getting concerned. So what did we do? What are some of the things that uh, are actions? Well, like I said, we activated the EOC at 4 o'clock. Um, we started mo mobilizing emergency generators. And we also called for mutual aid. And the reason for that is because we didn't have any permanent generators or some of our pumping stations. And so one of the primary functions of a water district is to make sure that firefighters have water to do their job. And so we were concerned about making sure that these, um, that our tanks were not just filled because that's one of the things that we do during a red flag morning is we make sure we top off all the tanks just in case there is a fire. But as this started going and going and going, we started having a lot of issues. The structures burned. We had a lot of, um, uh, main, well, we had one main line break for sure, then I'll show you a picture of what that is. We also had tap or service connections. When the structure burns, a lot of times uh, there's just water just spilling out of where So our job is to go in there and actually turn that off to make sure that the pressure in the system is enough for the firefighters to do their job. But we had to call for mutual aid because we needed to get some additional portable generators to some of our remote locations and tank sites. So we ultimately got one from Beverly Hills, and we ultimately got one from uh, the city of Fresno, of all places. 
they actually came down and delivered that for us really quickly. Um, we got uh, received additional flow pressure information from Metropolitan Water District, of course. Uh, we developed and implemented emergency response priorities, and that would have been first is to make sure that you save lives, the second thing is to save structures, and the third thing is to make sure that we do what we can to protect the environment in a disaster situation like this. Um, we did have the issue of boil water notice, but I can talk a little bit about that later. That was crazy. And um, obviously one of the most important things is to repair uh, main leaks and make sure that we had to send out staff all the time to make sure that those generators were fueled so those tanks would stay uh, filled. So uh, what were we doing in the EOC? One of the things that like is kind of interesting is that water personnel is also sort of considered first responders even though that we're not actually out there doing stuff in danger and harm's way. We do have to go in right after fire comes through and we were there hours, hours after things came through and shutting off connections and stuff like that. And I have several pictures to show you what that looked like and some of the things that I got to see. But uh, we had to monitor the distribution sensor, uh, just distribution sense, uh, system through SCADA. And that's basically, does everyone know what that is? It's a system of kind of, yeah, so we all know what that is. We had to communicate with in right? Does everyone know what it is, right? Yeah. We had to, we had to uh, communicate with incident command, make sure that we were telling that we had a liaison in there, uh, telling them what we needed. We monitored social media. That was one of our uh, best uses to communicate with the public, and specifically Twitter, because it's instantaneous. And so we got a lot of information. We could actually share a lot of information. We used Facebook and Nextdoor uh, quite a bit, especially for the boil water notice. Um, let's see. Um, one of the things that I think was really important that I wanted to share is that, like, as, as this event started to unfold, we would have customers that would call in or that we would meet in the field. And our personnel is not trained to be, like, you know, empathetic, but that's one of the things that I think <laughs> that the staff. Well, it's not because it's just it, really what I'm trying to say is that like the staff was just natural at being empathetic to <coughs> the people of lost homes. It's not like they had to be that way, but a lot of people just wanted to have somebody to talk to and listen to. And so a lot of our staff, whether it was sitting in the front office answering a phone or going out in the field and seeing people at their homes who just lost everything, and we were talking with them and we were listening to them and we were trying to comfort them. And so that was something that I think is kind of overlooked when it comes to a response, especially from an agency. You don't think that you would need to be doing those things, but we were put in that situation and we did, that, and we did do that. Uh, obviously, we had PPE as well uh, going out of field because the, the air is just horrible and toxic. Uh, this is basically the burn scar from the Wolsey fire. And again, this is our service area right here. And so close to two-thirds of our land service area are burned. That doesn't mean all the structures, of course, but two-thirds of the land area was burned in our service area. So this is a, this picture here is Saturday morning, and um, it was a super early in the morning, so I was up for almost 48 hours straight in the emergency operations center, so I grabbed myself like seven cups of coffee, and I went outside, and I just started snapping some pictures of kind of just capture what I was looking at. This is literally right outside our door. You can see how thick the smoke is. The Las Virginas Unified School District headquarters is literally right there where that sign is. So it was so thick with smoke that it was just hard to breathe even with our masks on. But this is, this is just hours after this fire came through. Um, this is maybe about 30 minutes after I took that picture. And so I walked way back up to our recycled water reservoir here up in the top right hand, right hand corner. But you can see uh, we actually got lucky and we um, didn't sustain any damage to our headquarters. The only thing we got was like a lot of smoke in there and it took a long time to get out. But you can still see that way up at the top of here, there's still a fire going on back there. This is our reservoir. You can see that all around is just burned up, and then we had uh, LA County Fire coming in and uh, actually getting water from a reservoir to fight the fire. So I was lucky enough to get some of these shots. Here's just a picture of some of our staff in the emergency operations center. Um, it was like one of those things where, you know, something goes down and you just all step up to the plate and you make it happen. And so our staff was super motivated, they care. 
They wanted to make sure that they were doing what they could to help our communities out. So this is just a, what we did. So uh, we have a composting facility, Rancho Las uh, Virgenes composting facility. This is seen probably a, a significant amount of damage. You can see that the fire is still going here. We actually have wood chips out here that we would use to create our compost with the biosolids that caught on fire. And uh, we should see some decent damage, but really it's just really was more of like, a, uh, like just sort of on the outside. So we got a little inside from some of the dust because there was vents like this one right here. And so some of the embers would get in there and that's kind of how we got some of the damage on the inside of the facility. But generally speaking, the firefighters came out here and handled business for us real quick, which was, which was really nice. This is our Westlake filtration plant. Again, uh, all the damage was really on the facade. Uh, on the outside, with the exception of here of this little pump area, but even though these dumps were uh, these pumps were so operable, so it was really just really kind of the outside of it. So nothing too too much. Again, very lucky that we didn't have more significant damage. <clears throat> so uh, our wastewater plant. Um, one of the great things about Incident Command is what the what is hey one of our one of our major facilities is in danger. So they came in and literally just started dropping. Um, fire retardant um, right around the fire was coming right at the facility and like I said before their main their three main focuses save lives save structures and save the environment and so they considered this something where it would save the environment because if there was a significant issue in Tapia there happened to be raw sewage that spill into Malibu Creek guess what it would go right into Santa Monica Bay so they didn't want to have that happen they came out with quick quickly and they took care of this for us so here's some of the pictures I wanted to show you um, our service area goes up into the Santa Monica Mountains, so kind of in the Santa Monica recreation area. And so this again is later on Saturday. Uh, me and one of my colleagues were out driving around turning off burnout service connections. And obviously I took the opportunity to kind of just, um, you know, take some pictures to memorialize the experience. Uh, but you can see burned out cars, uh, burned out machinery at people's homes. Um, Total homes loss. This is Malibu Lake here, um, but there was a lot of this that you see up in the mountains. Uh, this is just a great picture of what the fire does to the environment. I mean, this is just like a basically, to me, looks like a moonscape and with just some smoke still there. And so uh, this is one of the hardest hit areas, Corral Canyon area out in Santa Monica Mountains. Um, again, one of my uh, colleagues, this is who I was with, going out and turning off the service connection. Uh, what you don't see was the houses all around in here are still smoldering and there's actually water is still billowing out. And so we were doing this again to help make sure that the pressure in the system was still uh, adequate. The other thing is there was a person that was over here on the adjacent property who um, we you know experienced a huge loss and so when we were out there he actually was coming and yelling at us because he didn't want us to turn off his water but we had to do that and so that was one of those interfaces that you're not really expecting to have and you have to be compassionate and understanding about it right and so that was some of the things that we experienced going through this um, we met a lot of people on, on our outings uh, throughout this talk with LA County Fire telling us, hey, this is what's up there, this is what you can expect, there's down power lines, et cetera, et cetera. So that was cool. Um, we obviously did a lot of work in the field, so we communicated with each other as best we could. And this one thing, this bridge collapse here, um, basically a fire got so hot it melted the steel girders and it severed one of our water mains which then caused one of our tanks to start losing a lot of water, which then is why we had the issue of oil water notice. And those, and that is the tank that we used at the pumping stations with these two generators we got from those two communities. So that was a huge lifesaver for us. The oil water notice was in effect for probably five days straight. It's very difficult to both issue one, but it's also just as difficult to uh, actually take one away. So we, had, we experienced both sides of that as well. Um, saw a lot of this. This is just like a small water main break. Uh, so we saw these all over the place. So some of the things that I wanted to share with you that we learned in terms of lessons learned is um, when there's something that may come your way, it's better just to activate an emergency operations center rather than not do that. 
and or do what you need to do and get it done if it's going to save lives or structures or the environment. And if somebody gets upset with you, just ask for forgiveness because it's all, it's all of what you're supposed to be doing to help out. Um, again, like I said, we're first responders. I mean, getting to our location when the fire is burning around you and have all the sheriff's department kind of like, you know, uh, relegating who comes and goes, kind of like a gatekeeper, you know, showing them your badge and stuff like that. They're like, yeah, go ahead. So it's just kind of interesting to think of us as being first responders. Um, we were in the EOC for 12 hour shifts. The first time, the first day I was there for almost 24 hours straight, I went home for a few hours, came back and did another 12, 14, 15 hour shift. There's a lot of chaos, even though that you can get trained up, um, you're not doing this every day. So when you're in the moment, you're kind of learning as you go, but you can have some training, which helps you prepare mentally for things, but it's totally different when you're just in the midst of it happening. Um, the other thing is, if you think you need help, go go ahead and request that mutual aid because it's better to have it faster than not have it faster. And that's what we did. When we knew that we probably needed it, we called up and literally, I think it was like at six in the morning on Friday morning, uh, they were already working on get us a couple of generators. So that's how quick that worked for us, which was great. <laughs> One of the things that we definitely uh, experienced is uh, dealing with FEMA. FEMA is, is very difficult to deal with because they want to pay for, for absolutely everything. And so it takes a lot of time to get all your ducks in a row. So what that means is that when you're in that response mode, you still have to fill out all that paperwork that you're like, I don't want to do this. I got other things more important to do, but this is going to be important to do for the after effect, especially if you're going to get reimbursement money from FEMA and get insurance reimbursements and stuff like that. Um, and then one of the other things is, um, we got to test the emergency generators when under under a specific loads because a lot of times we don't get to do that. There's a lot of air quality regulations associated with testing generators and just actually running them. But one of the things that we need to do is make sure that it can handle different capacities. So that's another lesson that we learned as well. Um, we always you always need to have somebody in incident command as a liaison. Find out who that could be. Um, you know, issue timely public notices and updates with no delays using all types of communication platforms. Um, the emergency response is a sprint, but recovery is a marathon. You know, we're still dealing with FEMA stuff. Our, our composting facility is still not operating, and it's almost a year, a year ago. Um, social media is definitely an essential tool to communicate during a disaster, for sure. Uh, and like I said, Twitter is probably the main one that I used, and it seemed to work very well. And then the other thing is um, getting a mass notification system for your place of employment so you can both directly contact your customers but also your staff if needed in a disaster. And then um, there's always going to be an increased risk of power outages, um, especially after a disaster. And I think that we can all attest to that um, because now we're actually doing it before there could be a disaster, right? So. You know, these things are becoming more and more complicated. And it's kind of like, I think that one of the things that I wanted to kind of briefly just go over, and I think this makes sense to everybody in this room, is that in this point in time, energy and water are inextricably linked together. 20% of all the energy used in the state of California is simply just to move water. Um, but then again, you know, water also helps create electricity. So we're linked together. So when we move forward with trying to combat not just climate change, but also um, these natural disasters, we got to think about how these are linked together a little bit more clearly so we can make better choices and decisions. Um, investment in emergency backup power is a critical component as a lesson is learned for us. We just purchased some new generators here, so we would not need to use a mutual aid agreement, agreement unless it was even worse than what we experienced. Um, so we got these and uh, they're ready to go, which is great. Um, and then there's always going to be planning and planning and planning for additional and more resilient water systems. Um, I think one of the biggest things is making sure that your employees are trained and they go through some emergency preparedness <laughs> planning and training. I think that there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunities to go through and having table, uh, tabletop exercises, for instance, we did that today for the Great Shakeout. We had one in our emergency operations center. 
So you can see that there's a lot of things that we can do to make the kid be, to make our water systems more resilient than uh, than they currently are. Um, but I think one of the other things that we have here is that mutual aid agreement is going to be really, really important moving forward uh, with all the things that we've been seeing as well. Um, and so the last thing I just wanted to show you, this is the last picture I have, and the only reason why I wanted to show this to you is because I think this for me is the iconic picture of uh, the Woolsey fire when it comes to our facility because the fire literally, this is, this is just our, our, our yard and our facility is right here and everything around us all the way around was burning. And so we had Ventura County fire right there and the firefighters came. They didn't put the fire out, they just kept it away and it just burned all the way down uh, through Malibu because that's what they could do. I don't know if anybody knows this, I don't know, but water systems aren't engineered for wildfires to combat wildfires. And so when you have something like this, it's not, our system's not gonna be able to step up to the task. I think it's engineered to put out maybe the largest fire at the largest structure and in the area, in the service area. So with that, that's all I got for you. So I hope you learned a little something from it, but thanks for having me. Right, that was uh, really interesting. Things you don't think about when you're, say, a water manager or a sanitation agency manager, one of these wildfire areas, uh, just having to go through this and get yourself to be thinking about, you know, you probably wouldn't have thought about mutual aid. Say, well, you know, we're, we're good with our neighbors, but your neighbors are burning too. So, you know, you probably want to spread your wings out a little bit. So it was really, really very informative. Uh, we have some time for some questions. Do you have any questions? Anything? Yes, sir. Um, a question for, for Rob, actually. Uh, you were mentioning that you noticed that when there's like storm and then heavy rainfall, that you know, the plumbing code is not good. So how do you, how would you determine the threshold of how much like storm flush should go in or should be captured in order to like reduce the INI rates during like heavy storms? Ideally, you don't let any storm flow into your sewer system during a storm event. We have an urban runoff policy which says during dry weather you can discharge your door sewer. We have uh, rules for how that gets managed. But when it rains, we give a 24-hour notice, hey, the big storm's coming. It's going to be uh, an inch or more, and the permit requires them to shut off that flow. So in general, we do not advocate a combined storm sewer. That's, <coughs> that's madness. All of the East Coast is... Yeah. Many billions to fix it, so we're trying to resist the urge of everyone to try and uh, make that happen. There are better options, big um, impoundment ponds where you can uh, store and dribble. Those sorts of things are discussed, but allowing it in for our system where we don't have this, the big area for an impoundment, we can't do it. Any other questions? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, so and following up on that, um, so Bob, you mentioned on the, the Carson project, you are you are getting some but low flow uh, during wet weather. How do you manage that and make sure you don't inundate your destroying plant? Well, yeah, we will once that project's completed. So we have uh, level monitoring in the inlet sewer. So basically, uh, uh, if the sewer's below 75 percent, basically capacity, it'll allow flow in. Once it reaches that it'll shut off and they do have storage tanks there so they can store up to a certain point. And then to use Rob's technical term, store and dribble, after the storm, they can dribble back into the sewer when we have that excess capacity. So that's what a lot of people are looking at is the storage and then putting it in after the storm event. I wanna, I wanna Make sure I get that term copyrighted. You had a question? Yeah, uh, it's for Steve. Uh, on the ocean acidification, you indicated the, the biggest problem is deeper rather than in the shallow waters. And as, as one of the ways of addressing it is planting more kelp and seagrass, which I think of as shallower, uh, shallower water. So uh, how do they connect? The answer is not all that well. Um, so in a sense, what you have is two types of problems. You have a globally driven problem, um, and that's going to be your deeper waters, uh, 
and then you have the locally, uh, uh, not necessarily driven problem, but the locally effective problem. What you have theoretically, through what the state has referred to as tidal remediation, is the opportunity not to solve a global problem, but to mitigate the local areas enough that you might be able to have some. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, a question for Robert. I would say, like, how, how is the slurry that you mentioned that's created from food waste, how is that used to produce, like, compressed natural gas? How is that so the slurry, just like the uh, primary sludge and secondary waste activated sludge goes into anaerobic digesters, yeah. the slurry is fed into those as well. And uh, obviously not to get, I guess, too gross here, I guess we've all eaten, but uh, <laughs> the primary sludge, secondary waste activated sludge has already gone through a digestion system. The raw food waste has not, so it contains a lot more energy. So what we see is a lot of times with 10 to 15 percent of the volume being used with food waste that you almost uh, double the gas production out of the digesters. But it's anaerobic digestion of the food waste. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, a question for Steve. Um, thinking in the future with more and more brine going out into the ocean from recycled water or Colorado River water, etc., is that part of the equation of what you're looking at? Maybe even positive, positive and negative of that changing mineral content. So, first off, the answer is yes. That is something that we work that we think about and work on. Um, when you think about brine. Um, in essence, you're, as you're talking about reuse and you put out brine, it's not like you're putting out more contaminants into the ocean than you put out before. You're probably putting out less um, because the brine isn't capturing everything. Some of it goes to the other place. So the total volume which you put out, what happens is the concentration goes up. Now, with good diffusers, maybe you resolve that. I think the issue that's the most interesting challenge, though, is the diffusers that are built at present are built around the concept of you're putting out water that's lighter than the seawater, and it goes up, and it hits the thermocline, and it spreads out. With brine, you may have a circumstance where it well, doesn't go up or doesn't go up as fast, or alternatively, might even go down. Um, so some of the work that we're doing, in fact, quite specifically, this work we're doing for Orange County and Sanitation District, is taking some of those physical models that we did, uh, we're building, and building them at an even higher intensity. I told you that we had these, these cells that are 300 meters. And for theirs, it's actually down to around 10 meters by 10 meter cells, so that we can mimic <laughs> what happens if you put denser water in and different types of different levels of denser water in to see where that water goes. And so I think the danger is probably not that the word environment as a whole gets worse, but are you concentrating a lot of the stuff that starts to fall out in the sediment gets concentrated in an area because you have a potential to enable the experiments. This question for Mike. So at the end of your presentation you mentioned that you don't believe that water districts are well equipped to combat like uh, wildfire. Do you think there would ever be a time when they would be? Well, I, I, what the point I was making is that, that the, the system, the infrastructure itself isn't designed to combat wildfires, right? right? And I think that if they were going to design something like that, I don't think it would be, I think they're so cost prohibitive that it wouldn't make sense. So I don't know in that respect if that would ever happen. I do think that there obviously are things that any agency can do to make sure that they're definitely better prepared to handle something like that. But that's, that's the point I was trying to make. Other questions? Blake, I had a question for you. You experienced these leaks. Was that as a result of some of the water hammer that was created as a result of fire Absolutely, fires yeah. opening up fire hydrants uh, fast and sure. closing them even faster? Yeah, without a doubt. There is a lot. I mean, when you have you know an aging infrastructure, you're going to find spots where uh, they may be slightly, uh, you know, weak in different areas, and when you change the pressure so dramatically, so many times, that's when you're going to have uh, blowouts like that. So we saw several of those 
we had to go back in and do those repairs um, quite often, actually, even even after work for a while. So yeah, I mean that that's a major problem. Yep. Really interesting. Any other uh, questions or anything? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question for Tracy. Um, you're talking about the spreading of the water and eventually maybe might possibly be injecting the water to ground water level. And I'm curious of what's the limitation to that? There must be a threshold of like you no know, keeping a balance um, in the environment. And also, would that be eventually be a way to recharge the aquifer using that recycled water? That's exactly what it's doing. Uh -huh. So if we're doing the spreading, it is recharging yeah, the groundwater yeah. aquifer. Mm -hmm. um, you can either do it by surface spreading, um, or you can do it by injection, like deep, deep well injection directly into the, the soil aquifer. Vatosome, I think is what they call it. Um, so regulations, I'm not real good on this, but the regulations as far as obtaining the permit, that certain standards that only allow you to put like X percent of recycled water blended with the surface water. So if it's stormwater spreading um, and you're adding recycled water uh, to a stormwater spreading basin, you can only put 10 percent, so I'm not sure of the number, of that uh, as recycled water. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, this is a general question. How can like sanitation districts ensure that the groundwater basins are capped up as much as possible during drought? Like, what the procedures can usually go through for that? Well, really, sanitation districts don't actually manage the groundwater basins. There are water uh, replenishment districts or water masters that actually manage that water, and those are the ones that. Uh, you know, uh, our agencies will clean the water, there's Department of Water and Power, and Metropolitan will work with those agencies on uh, maximizing deliveries to them. Uh, so that, that would be the goal in trying to manage the system too. They get more people as they put more water in, they also want more people to utilize that local supply as well. But it's the Water Masters, Water Replenishment Districts. Anything else? Any other questions? I think we give a big hand to our